Chapter 7 The Autotelic Experience Everything we've described here, the loss of self, time, and space, are not the most ordinary of experiences. When people bump into these phenomena, it's a rare encounter. This is also why William James described the state as mystical, and Abraham Maslow borrowed quasi-Buddhist terms like self-actualization for its long-term effect. Or as basketball legend Bill Russell explains in his biography Second Wind, you really do feel psychic. Here's Bill Russell explaining the transcendent experience. Every so often, a Celtic game would heat up so that it became more than a physical or even mental game and would be magical. That feeling is difficult to describe, and I certainly never talked about it when I was playing. When it happened, I could feel my play rise to a new level. The feeling would spread to the other guys, and we'd all levitate. And then the game would just take off, and there'd be a natural ebb and flow that reminded you of how rhythmic and musical basketball is supposed to be. I'd find myself thinking, this is it. I want this to keep going. And I'd actually be rooting for the other team. When their players made spectacular moves, I wanted their shots to go in the bucket. That's how pumped up I'd be. I'd be out there talking to the other Celtics, encouraging them, and pushing myself harder. But at the same time, part of me would be pulling for the other players too. At that special level, all sorts of odd things happen. It was almost as if we were playing in slow motion. I could almost sense how the next play would develop during those spells, and where the next shot would be taken, even before the other team brought the ball in bounds. I could feel it so keenly that I'd want to shout to my teammates, it's coming there, except that I knew everything would change if I did. My premonitions would be consistently correct, and I always felt then that I not only knew all the Celtics by heart, but also all the opposing players. There have been many times in my career when I felt moved or joyful. But these were the moments when I had chills pulsing up and down my spine. The game would be in a white heat of competition, and yet somehow, <laughs> I wouldn't feel competitive, which is a miracle in itself. I'd be putting out the maximum effort, straining, coughing up parts of my lungs as we ran, and yet, I never felt the pain. On the occasions when the game ended at that special level, I literally didn't care who had won. If we lost, I'd still be as free and as high as a Skyhawk. But I had to be quiet about it. At times, I'd hint around to the other players about this feeling, but I never talked about it much, least of all to the other Celtics. I felt a little weird about it and quite private. Besides, I couldn't let on to my teammates that it was ever all right to lose. I had too much of an influence on the team. We were the Celtics, and our reason for being was to win championships. So I had to keep those private feelings to myself. As the book evolves, I will gradually lay out the methodology for triggering such a state. Once you begin applying the triggers described in part four of the book, you'll immediately start producing more flow in your life. But you need to know that the flow path, just like any path, has its struggles and pitfalls. Committing to this path demands a considerable tolerance for risk and a considerable shift of our mindset. It's a job to continuously find flow, says Mike Horn, arguably the greatest living adventurer. You have to train your body to prepare for the state. You have to train your mind to prepare for the state. You have to know yourself and your limits, know exactly what you're afraid of, and how hard to push past it. That's serious work. Therefore, part three of the book will provide you with a mindset that guides you through these struggles and pitfalls. But get it right, Mike Horn continues, and not only does it become easier to find flow once, it becomes easier to find it again and again.